concept of what the components are. Okay, so we're gonna. You look a little nervous now. <laughs> Good start from square one. Yeah, well, we're, we're not gonna overhaul the engine, so. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. <laughs> what are those white things are? <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off with a basic, purely mechanical engine. No electronics, zero, none. All right, then we're going to work up to a quite a bit more complex engine, which is you're going to find that your producers will have in their newer. Anything from a diesel pickup to a semi to a tractor to a swath or whatever. Okay, so this engine's uh, this brand's an international. It's a DT four sixty six. Has four hundred sixty six cubic inches of displacement. D stands for direct injection, and T stands for turbocharged. All right. There was a DTA four sixty six. The A stood for after cooling. This is very common in international tractors, combines, semi trucks loaders, very, very common engine, um, very strong engine, kind of small, it's only like about 100 and, or 210 horsepower, so not real powerful, but it was a, it's kind of a workhorse. So, and these were again what? Filters. Very good. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's our filters. Now this engine is not characteristic of most because this actually has three filters. Okay, so we have our fuel storage tank right here, and this one you note we have a clear plastic on the bottom. So this is, remember we talked about the water fuel separator? This is a water fuel separator. So fuel comes in, it's going to be like a centrifuge, run around, water gets forced out, and will dribble down to the bottom. Once we get so much water in, we can just open that up, drain the water out, and we're good to go. So theoretically, the water does not progress any further. Now there is some water that will be suspended in the fuel that will go further, but that's like a really, really small amount. We don't, we're not too concerned about that, okay? So this is a primary water fuel separator. This is aftermarket. Um, Raycor was um, totally separate from um, International. I have retrofitted several engines with actually with Raycor water fuel separators. That's a piece of cake. We have a bracket, we have an in, and we have an out. I mean, how simple can it be? Okay. If your customer, or your customers, your producers don't have a water fuel separator, I would highly suggest that you visit with them about that. It'll be mounted on the engine, the frame rail. Okay, no big deal. All right. We come into our primary filter. Then we have our, from our primary filter, we're going to go through this little contraption right here. That is called my transfer pump. Now, I don't care what the fuel system is. It can be this old system. We have a brand new or a relatively new high pressure common rail. Every f engine has a transfer pump on it. The transfer pump, the reason it is there is to suck fuel from the tank and put it to the injection apparatus. All right, whether it be an injector or whether it be this, this one right here, okay? So everyone has it. This one, this whole conglomeration right here is actually my high pressure pump. Okay, so this is, in this engine, this is what creates the injection pressure, all right? Sends it out these high um, pressure lines, and underneath of each one of these, there's a small injector. And basically, all, the, uh, all that's underneath there, there is a body, there is a nozzle needle, and there is a spring. That's pretty much all there is. This pressure, fuel pressure, overcomes the spring pressure in the injector, lifts the nozzle, one shot of fuel. It's done. How big okay. is the opening on the injector? Uh, I will show you. I have some over here. They are very, very small. Very small. So that's one of the issues is that they can easily get plugged, right? Either from the inside with debris or from the cylinder with unburned fuel, all right? So we get that, that coke and uh, stuff on there so it can plug them up as well, okay? This fuel pump... Um, when we first started, remember I talked about the four cycles of the engine, all right? So we have that when we were coming off compression, compression, we're compressing that air, we're making it nice and toasty warm, we stuff some fuel in there, minute yard, little teeny little droplets, boof, it burns, we have an explosion. The, the, so this, the timing of when we inject that fuel is called degrees before top dead center. 
So top dead center is when that piston is all the way up. All right, so when I'm coming up, we're before the top dead center, right? So it's called BTDC, before top dead center. The degrees is actually the angle of the crankshaft. All right, and you don't know, we won't get too far into that. That's like a, like a semester long fuels class to get that far, it's okay? So this pump has to be timed to the engine. So if you have a customer, or a, I keep saying that word customer, if you have a producer who, who you know, for whatever reason calls you and says, well, I just had my pump replaced and now my engine won't start. Well, yeah, you might want to have the, the, the uh, producer double check and make sure that timing is correct on the fuel pump. Okay. It's really not all that tough to do, um, but if, if you, to that point, they probably need to be calling a technician. All right. A um, couple of things to note. This is a high pressure pump. Now back in the day, this would produce maybe about 10,000 psi of fuel pressure. Back in the day, well, that still is a lot of fuel pressure. Compared with another engine we'll look at, it's pretty light pressure. All right. If you don't respect it, and we're going to get back to safety, you'll get sick and tired of me hearing about safety. I'm very big on safety. If you do not, or if your agri producer does not respect it, they will get hurt. All right, in the conversation, okay, and they can get seriously hurt. Um, you probably know that you know if you get grease or fuel injected under your skin, well, your day just ended because you're going to the ER. All right, and I've got the pictures if you want to see them. They're not nice, okay. Very dangerous thing. Now, with these older engines, you know, you have a, 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 a producer that says, "Well, my engine's kind of missing. It's running a little rough." So one little trick that you can do with this engine running is we do what we call a short out an injector. So while the engine's running, all I need to do is I take my little trusty three quarter inch wrench. And I'm listening to this engine and I think, you know what, it kind of sounds like number five cylinder is, is not hitting. It's, the piston's going up and down, but for whatever reason, we're not having any controlled explosion. We're not doing anything with that cylinder. So what I can do is I can take my wrench. When the engine's running, I can actually just take it right here and I can just loosen off that line. I would also advise you to maybe put a rag over the top because when I loosen it off, this high pressure fuel is going to spurt out here. It's going to end up about here somewhere. It does because I've actually had students take a shower and that stuff. They just won't listen. Okay. <laughs> okay, loosen that off. Now, if this injector was seized shut, you know, wasn't firing, then if I was to do that, what would happen to the note or the sound of the engine? Do you think it would change? It wouldn't, okay? Because this injector, for whatever reason, is not working. All right, now, if the noise got worse, well, it could have been this one or this one here was the bad one. All right, does that kind of make sense? Yep. Okay, so the three quarter inch wrench just works just fine. You could actually do it down here with a flare nut wrench, which is a lot easier to do it up here. But just remember the safety glasses are in the goggles. All right, always tell your uh, producers about the safety aspect of it, all right? So that's just a real quick way of doing that. Another way to do it, and again, I like kind of spending other people's money, is for them to buy a non-contact temperature gun. It'll cost them about 100 bucks, and you can use it for, oh man, a multitude of things. I bought my Myers about $125, got a, a category two laser pointer on it. So where I pull the trigger, wherever that dot is at, that's where the temperature is. So fuel systems, um, bearings, air conditioning systems, you name it, brakes, you name it, you can measure it. You get a, a real-time temperature, and now you can compare that. Well, I got a high temperature on this brake corner, but these here, all the others are different temperature. I've got a problem over here. What they can do with that temperature gun is they go around the other side. We have our exhaust manifold. So if they were to take a shot of each exhaust outlet where it comes out of the, the engine, all those temperatures should be pretty much the same. If they're not, we know we've got a problem with a cylinder. We don't know what the problem is, but we've, we've narrowed it down to where that possible cause could be, okay? So just, uh, you know, in their toolboxes, and I tell my students, at the end of your semester here, I better see a non-contact temperature gun in your toolbox, all right? My students get a very extremely good discount from Snap on a Mac, so they got no excuse not to have the. It'll cost them 40 bucks, actually, is what it'll cost them. You know, so it's, it's very lucrative. Um, as I said, you'll use that in every cotton picking class you have on this campus on our side. So, very good tool. Um, 
everything from this fuel tank through here up to this point is under suction. All right. Really, really good opportunity to have air leaks. Really good opportunity. Most of these are a flare fitting. So obviously if they're too loose, they're going to leak. Right? They're going to suck in air. However, if I over tighten them, I can also deform the ceiling surface and I'll also get leaks. If it's too loose, we just tweak it and tighten it up. If it's over tightened and the ceiling surface is crushed, well, we're going to buy new lines and new fittings. All right, and I've seen that more than once. So a radically running engine could be because we're getting air in the system as well. Okay. Another thing that, and I've personally done this, is you spin this off, and there's a little gasket under there, right? So we should be double checking to make sure the old gasket's on there. We put the new filter on, because trust me, two filters is not better than one filter. It doesn't work out real good. All right. So you lose fuel, you suck in air, and just life goes to heck in a handbasket. Okay. I took my car to the GMC dealer in Bozeman, and like two days later, there was oil dripping on the bottom of my garage. And I took it back over, and they left the old gasket on. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Good to know it's not just me. <laughs> 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 and a lot of times, I mean, I was just in a hurry. It happens, you know? Yeah. Now, once I come out of my little transfer pump right here and go through my secondary filter all the way into here, that is under what we call charge pressure. And that pressure is just the pressure from the transfer pump. It is not this pressure here. That's only about maybe 60 to 100 PSI, right? So it's not real, not dangerous, just kind of messy if you get a loose line. The nice thing is, if there is a loose line, you're going to see fuel coming out. So it's pretty easy to figure out where the leak is at, all right? So, you know, we have a, a low power complaint. We have a rough running engine. Well, you know, forget about your injectors. All right, forget about the fuel pump. Let's talk about the filter and the fuel. Let's check for air leaks and all that stuff before we start replacing any of these other components. A rebuilt one of these things here is about $2,000. All right, so even an old engine, they're not cheap. All right, a lot of money involved. Okay, any questions on this one? All right, so Jason, we okay to move? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna come over here. Well, actually, we're just going to right behind you here is where we're going to go. Yep. There we go. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is a Cummins L10. Uh, again, a very popular engine. Uh, totally mechanical. There's one electrical connection, and that is this one right here. This, this engine is actually the injector that creates the fuel pressure. That engine, it was a fuel pump. This one's an injector, okay? That's what's called a unit injector. So this, all this is is basically just to create flow from the tank up to the rail inside the head into the injector. This is an electric shutoff switch. <coughs> I have seen these, <coughs> excuse me, get broken many, many times. And you can click this on and you can push and hold that start button until the cows come home. It is not going to start because this electric shutoff pushes a valve into the fuel line so no fuel goes through. All right? You turn the key off, slams into the fuel, shuts the fuel off, engine shuts down. All right. So if you do have a, a, a producer that you know, says, well, I've replaced the fuel pump and changed the oil, most of the time, actually, I've seen it when, when uh, customers change oil because we have a frame rail down here. When I'm leaning up here to pull the oil in my um, valve cover, this is a really good place to rest my foot. You know, so I'm kind of doing this trick, and my big old foot gets right in here and snaps that right off. So, well, I didn't do anything. Well, actually, yeah, you did, but, you know. So we talk about it and we maybe educate them in another way that they can position their body ergonomically correct to change their oil, all right? Because now they've got the oil change, everything's done, they fire that thing up and it cranks and nothing happens, all right? It's a pretty quick fix. We just get a new terminal on there and life is good, all right? Now, some of your customer or your producers are pretty mechanically adept and they're going to do some stuff by themselves, which is great. Okay. Number one is your operator's manual. We've talked about that. 
Number two, they need to know exactly what the torque specs are when they use their torque wrench to clamp down some of these bolts. Because if they don't, so these injectors are held in by what's called an injector hold down. Um, it's uh, just a, you see this is what it is right here. So there's my injector hold down right here. So it sits over the top of the injector, two bolts go in, holds the injector in the head. These bolts are torqued to inch pounds. If you transfer inch pounds to foot pounds, this is what happens. All right, that's not good. Okay, and no, I didn't get I didn't get mad at the student. He came and told me right away, and I said, you know what? If you're going to break something, this is probably the place you need to do it. Not out in the real world. So this is 20 bucks, but the issue is if your producer is relying on this engine to haul the grain or to plow the field or do whatever. It's not happening today. It's not going to happen for a couple of days. That can be some pretty serious consequences to his bottom line if he doesn't get that seed in or got the grain hold or whatever. Okay? So torque wrenches are, are an absolute must if they're going to be working on their own equipment. Okay? Now we'll leave this one over here. Um, these injectors, this, the torque on this nut right here is very, very specific. It is six inch pounds. And I was kind of, um, Cummins was kind of my forte of engines. I worked a little on Caterpillar, a lot of, lot of Cummins, and then a little teeny bit on Detroits and some others, a lot of, on the internationals. So I actually bought a tool, and you know, if, if your customer wants to invest in this tool, great. It's a six inch pound torque wrench. All it does is this right here, and it'll cost them about $125 to $150. So probably not a real good investment, but if he's gonna be working, he or she's gonna be working on their own equipment, they probably wanna do that. All right. Okay, so this is a unit injector. We have intake and exhaust valves, and this is our injector in the center. All right. Now this is classified as a common rail engine. It is not a high pressure common rail. The reason it's common rail is because the fuel comes out of here, and actually, well, it goes in here and goes down a gallery inside the head to feed the injectors. All right, we still have our filters. Um, we're actually gonna have one on this engine. Real world would actually should have two filters on this. Okay, one would be on the frame rail somewhere. All right, okay, good on this one? All right, so we're gonna move over here a little bit. Now some of us should be kind of familiar with this one if we have a power stroke. <laughs> so this, this one here is a little bit of a different animal. Um, the first engine we looked at, we had that big fuel pump that was on the side of the engine, and that created the injection pressure. That engine there, was we call a unit injector, and I'll show you those injectors. We have, I have a whole table full of injectors over here. We actually have a rocker pushing down on a plunger to create the injection pressure. This one, and there's this one, and some Caterpillar engines, and also the, the, the Navistar and the Power Stroke pickups, has what's called the Huey system, all right? The Huey stands for Hydraulically Actuated, Electronically Controlled Unit Injector, right? Kind of a mouthful. But in essence, if you look on the top of that, there's no rocker pushing anything down here. What we're gonna use is actually engine oil to, to make the, or the, the fuel pressure come out the bottom of this injector, okay? So now, once again, we're gonna put the engine oil cleanliness into the mixture of our fuel system, okay? So the, the type of oil we're using, the, how often we're changing the oil, the viscosity, the filters, all plays in now with our fuel system. Essentially, what we're gonna do is, and I'll, we have another engine I'll show you, we have a, another oil pump that's gonna take oil from the oil gallery and it's gonna pump it up to anywhere from 400 to 4,000 PSI of oil pressure. That's a lot of oil pressure. The fuel pressure that comes out the bottom, it's just a, mag it's a, it's a uh, multiplication of seven. So if I have 1,000 PSI of oil pressure, I'll have 7,000 pounds of fuel pressure. All right, that's, that's just a, you know, basically that's the way it's a, an amplification inside the injector. We don't need to get into that, right? You'll note that we do have some electrical connections here. Let's talk about safety again. In order to change this from fuel to no fuel, fuel, no fuel, fuel, no fuel, 
we have to have a lot of voltage and a lot of amperage to have these solenoids, there's this basic solenoid in there, to make it happen quick. This one here is 108 volts DC, pushing about 20 amps. Now, if you mess with that stuff, it's going to kill you. Okay? I said in all seriousness. The one other bad thing about, or I guess negative thing, not a bad thing, but a negative thing about this particular system, you guys know what a capacitor is? You heard the word capacitor, it's going to store the voltage. There's an, there's an ECM with some injector drivers. Inside those injector drivers, there's, there's capacitors. So even with that key off, all right, the engine's not running. For whatever reason, if we turn that key on, if the computer decides for whatever reason that it needs to fire an injector, even with the engine not running, it's still got that capacitor with voltage to fire that injector. Now, if you're holding on to this clip right here, whoops, okay, not a good thing, all right. Um, I have a little bit of a weaker heart, so if I was to do this and then just kind of lean on the fender, it's going to go right through my chest cavity and, well, I hope you'll come to my funeral, all right. Some of you are older, you know, or you know, younger guys like me with weaker hearts, I mean, that's a pretty serious issue. So if, you're, if your producer is going to be working on this stuff, you know, they better be gosh darn careful, really, really careful, okay get in the manual, and they need to figure out how to discharge those capacitors before they start pulling injectors. And to pull these injectors is actually a piece of cake. It's just a couple of bolts. They pop out, put the new one in, you're ready to go. Rebuilt ones of these, I think, are 180 200 bucks. They're not, you know, I mean, that's still $180, $200, but compared with another one we can look at here shortly, that's pretty cheap, all right? So that's kind of what you're looking at with your power stroke. Yeah, but, you know, if you change times eight, that's a lot of money, but typically you wouldn't be changing eight injectors. All right. So you recommend just changing it? If you got one bad injector, you just change one bad injector. You should have brought a JP. could have been a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Case study right there. <laughs> we could have watched. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, how do you test if your heart is weak or not? Yeah. Um, this fuel system was actually a collaboration between Caterpillar and Navistar. All right, so this is actually an international head. It's off of 530E, which um, I know my uh, nephew has one up in Turner, and his, his, uh, he has a spreader truck, fertilizer spreader truck, and he has this exact, uh, it's a 530E he has in his. Okay, so some of your um, uh, ag producers probably have a pretty good chance of having this engine. Okay, uh, it was put in the Ford Power Stroke. Caterpillar used it in some of their smaller dozers and some of their tractors. All right, so chances of it coming across this fuel system pretty good. One thing that between this, and this one and the Caterpillar, which we'll look at here shortly, this is what we call our fuel oil manifold. So we have a, if you see there's a big plug in the end here, that's oil. The small plug is fuel. This manifold, you note, has a whole bunch of bolts, and we have a gasket between the manifold and the head. If your customer or your, can you keep using that word, if your producer changes out this manifold for whatever reason and does not torque down these bolts correctly, you will not seal between these two right here. Okay, so you have a potential for either fuel and or an oil leak. And if I'm talking about 4,000 potential PSI of oil, if you get an oil leak, you're going to see it. You're also going to have some pretty bad engine performance. All right, it's going to be real rough running, hard starting, low power, fuel economy goes to hick in a handbasket, all that good stuff. Okay? So efficiency is pretty much out the window. All right? So if they do that, again, torque is a good thing. Okay? Um, okay, I think we're good on this one. Any questions on this one? All right, let's come on over this side. We're going to start getting a little more complicated. So this is, oops, sorry, ready, Jason? Mm -hmm. This is our um, Caterpillar counterpart. So this is a Huey system also, all right? So it's a little bit different. Um, this one, you know, you know, we have the oil and the fuel and the manifold in that one. This one here, the oil is on the outside, but this is actually cast as part of the head, 
right? So there's no gaskets or anything like that to worry about. The fuel actually goes into the end of the head and goes through a, a, a common rail on the inside of the head. Fuel pressures, you know, we're looking up to pushing 30,000 psi of peak fuel pressure, which is a lot of fuel coming out. And this is actually, you can pass it around. That's actually one of the injectors right there. That's out of one of these engines. Okay, a little bit different than the other one. So if you look on the bottom, you might be able to barely see a whole bunch of teeny little holes. All right, that's where the fuel comes out. So usually between five and, and eight holes in the bottom, depending upon manufacturer. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Tiny little things. Yeah. So Take that's. Your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I got some beachfront probably to sell you too. <laughs> so the inside of there, the fuel goes on the inside. We have a plunger that pushes down on top of that fuel, and we have this much fuel broken into all kinds of little droplets. Boof, we atomize inside the, um, or burn inside the, the um, combustion chamber. Okay. So this, how many microns are those? A half? <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm not sure how micron-wise how big they are to be quite honest, the holes. Okay. Not sure. Most of the engine companies want the fuel droplets to be between 50 and 100 microns. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, they're still reasonably big. The thing is, they get them, start getting too small, then they're actually going to vaporize before they burn. Right. And if they're too big, then obviously we're not going to burn them. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm just going to reach around behind you here. This here is actually, you can see all that drop in it, our high pressure pump. Right. Now, this is the oil pump. So, this is the, this, this particular one here will suck oil from the engine. All right. So, it puts it into this reservoir pressurizes it, puts it into this gallery, then it goes to that injector. So that's what's going to create the injection pressure, is basically this pressurized oil. This is for anywhere from 480 to 4,000 psi. That is not my engine oil pressure. If I have 4,000 psi in, the, in that engine, I've got some pretty serious problems. I won't have an engine, all right? Because <laughs> we will not have any, any oil anywhere, okay? So that is just for the fuel system. Now, the, if you look at the size of that injector, you can probably imagine that all the little galleries and RFI inside that injector for that oil flow are pretty cotton pick and small. So if I don't take, pay attention, or your producers don't pay attention to the quality of the oil, of the oil filters, changing the oil, oil handling, obviously going to affect my engine, it sure as heck going to affect my fuel system as well, because that's what we're relying on to get the fuel pressure, is that an, uh, oil in that injector. Okay, so we're not injecting the oil, we're injecting the fuel. All right. Okay, good on this one? Okay. So you have an oil leak in this one. I'm sure we probably have more than one. They're awful clean. Holy crap. And they're so easy to work on when they're out here on the road. Aren't they though, right? <laughs> but all the way around them. You can see everything. See everything. Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, some of my students still have accidents. So that's actually supposed to be bolted on the back of there. And I'm not sure. Apparently, we didn't get bolts lined up or something because there still has to be a chunk of metal over there. That's kind of got broke. Oh, well. It happens. And as I told the student, you know what? I'm sure glad it happened here and not with a customer. I really am. So they get, they get, I mean, they, they are mortified if they break something. They really are. So you, it happens. I'm glad it happened here and not in the real world. All right. Well, if they're going to do that for a living, they're probably going to break some things. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely they are. Absolutely. Yeah. We just hope they break the less expensive things. <laughs> All right. We're going to come right over to right behind you here, Jason. Let's come over to this one. So now we're going to ramp up the ante just a little. So if you guys just going to kind of come around in a little curve around here, we're going to look at this section right here. So this is a uh, C15 caterpillar, no, this is a C12 caterpillar, excuse me, uh, close to a little over 400 horsepower. Very common in, um, say, Challenger tractors and loaders and semi-trucks. So, you know, chances of you coming across this engine sometime are probably pretty good. This is the injector in this engine, okay? So this is what we call an EUI or an MEUI. 
That stands for Mechanically Actuated Electronically Controlled Unit Injector. So there's one of these injectors per cylinder. This is what creates the injection pressure. So now we're back to our injector creating the injection pressure. All right. We still have our transfer pump down here. Still does the same thing. It sucks fuel from the tank and puts it into a common rail. Not a high pressure common rail, just a regular common rail inside the head. And we'll actually have fuel going in right in this hole here. Okay. Mechanically actuated. Um, this contraption on top is called a jake brake. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but basically that's a, a compression brake. When you hear trucks pulling into town, you hear brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
if you're on highway, you know, weight is money. So if you can trade out your steel wheels and go with aluminum wheels, go with wide base singles, so the super singles versus dual tires, take a little bit of weight off every injector, that means I can haul more on the back of my trailer to get to my GVW, whatever I haul, that's what I make my money on. I don't make any money hauling steel wheels all over the country, all right? That's what I haul, okay? And some of your producers, they're in the business of hauling grain or cattle, so it, it's money to them, okay? All right, so any questions on this one? Okay, so let's come on over here. Um, let's stop at this one real quick. Actually, I'm just going to put that cover back on there real quick. Some sort of active cleanliness here. Oh, let's just, one more thing on this side here. Let's have a look at this little bubble. If you guys could just kind of conglomerate around here. This here is becoming pretty important. This is my ECM right here, okay? You'll note that we do have two wiring harnesses. One wiring harness is for the engine. So it's, it's looking at the sensors, its inputs from the sensors into the ECM. It's also controlling the injectors. It might be controlling a fan clutch, yeah, whatever. The other wiring harness is for whatever the via, this, en this engine is going into. It could be a cat tractor, it could be a freight liner truck, it could be a Peterbilt truck, it could be a cat loader. You know, so whatever the application is, that's your second wiring harness. Every time we have little electrons running around in our electrical circuits, these things get hot. They get very hot. Now, if I start putting heat to an electronic circuit, I'm going to have problems. Okay? So manufacturers have two different ways of cooling these types of ECMs. Number one is by air. And actually, I need to check. So this is actually my number. This is actually both. So if I look behind here, I can see this ECM has stood off my block about yay far, which means I have airflow all around this ECM. If I also look here, I can see a fuel line. So I'm actually cooling this ECM with fuel as well as air. Now the, the fuel is not flowing through the ECM. That'd be really bad, all right? <laughs> so what we have is we have a fuel cooling plate and we have an ECM bolted together. The fuel flows through the cooling plate. So I have heat transfer from the ECM through the cooling plate into the fuel and out to the tank. All right? So th most of them are, is either fuel or it's air cooled. This one's actually the best of both worlds. So they've done a pretty good job here, actually. Done a really good job. In an agricultural situation, you know, we're running around in those fields and we have all this grass and chaff and all other crap that's floating around. This, to me, looks like a pretty gosh darn good place to start getting a whole bunch of crap in there, yeah. right? We, we overlay it in the wintertime. That looks like a pretty awesome place for a mouse to build a little house in there, all right? So, an erratically running engine, hard starting, multiple symptoms, I'd be checking stuff like that, all right? Uh, if there's a mouse house in there, then we're not going to have a whole lot of cooling going on, all right? Get that mouse house out of there and see what happens, okay? If I have a whole bunch of chaff in there and it's the middle of summer and I'm running a little bit hotter, that's a pretty good chance of a fire. Okay, so your producers need to be paying attention to a physical inspection. I would say if they're in the, in the harvest field, I'd be doing that like twice a day. I really would. Yeah, because that's a fire hazard waiting. It's not if it's going to happen, it's just a matter of when it will happen. Okay, so it's all back to safety and just paying attention to those little details. Okay. That always happens. Oh, yeah. That's when the fire starts. Exactly. If you're just out in the field and if you're by yourself, that's not going to start. But no. you pull around three or four people and... Poof. That's <laughs> yeah. Happens. That's what happens. And you and then you're like, yep. <laughs> yep. Should have looked out this morning. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. All right. Let's come on over. Last stop will be over. Actually, a couple stops over here. We're going to look at the... Latest and greatest. Well, I need to go and find me another injector first. Latest and greatest. So any of that engine over there with all the tags on it, please? I need to find another injector to show you guys. Okay. 
So this is an engine from Finland. This is a Sisu engine, which is used in Massey Ferguson tractors and Massey Ferguson combines. So totally um, agricultural applications, all right? This is the latest fuel system, which has been around since, uh, I guess, mid-2000s. This is the high-pressure common rail fuel system, which is what your um, producers will be dealing with uh, not a matter of if they deal, with, just a matter of when. They're probably some of them are dealing with it right now, others they will be dealing with it eventually. Um, I absolutely love this fuel system. And, you know, Europe had it for like 10 years before we did. We've had this technology for probably about 30 years. We just figured out we probably should use the technology. You know, it's taken care of a lot of our issues as far as emissions. If you want fuel efficiency and you want power, this is the fuel system you need to have. Now, some drawbacks. Uh, the latest fuel system of this configuration in Europe is running 50,000 psi of injection pressure. That is some very, very serious pressure. Okay, That will kill you. End of conversation. This engine here if you remember, we had an external fuel pump, right? This engine and this head and those other engines, we actually used the injector to create the fuel pressure, right? So we didn't have an external high pressure pump. Well, I've come full circle, and this is the one thing I do not like about this fuel system. This right here is my high pressure pump, okay? Gear driven, doesn't have to be timed. We slap it on there and we fire it up. The ECM will decide what the fuel pressure is going to be. So if the ECM decides that we need 40,000 psi of fuel pressure, that is what comes out of this pump. Comes out of these lines. This is my high pressure common rail, hence the name high pressure common rail fuel system. I'll have 40,000 psi of fuel pressure in here. I have 40,000 psi of fuel pressure coming through this line, going through here into this injector. So that, it, to me, is the biggest drawback. So remember on this engine over here, we took out our little trusty three-quarter inch wrench and we cracked the line to crack that injector. I don't have the correct wrench for this one, so I'm just going to use this nut wrench. If you ever see an agricultural producer doing this with the engine running, I don't give a crap how friendly you are with him or her, you are yelling. All right? You do not ever, ever, ever crack these lines. And I mean never. Even with, when it's not running? Uh, to a point. We'll get to that. Okay, that's a good question. With the engine running, you never, ever do that, guys. All right, you're gonna, someone's going to get seriously hurt. Okay? So there's a real big safety concern there. But theoretically, uh, technically, that's really the only thing I don't like about this fuel system. Good fuel system comes with a good price, obviously. Okay? So this is kind of a represent, this, this injector is actually out of, uh, I think it's actually out of this black engine right here. This is a little Cummins engine right here. But it's basically the same as what's in here. This injector here is two grand. Yeah. Price just went way up. <laughs> okay. So now, in order to get the fuel from here into the injector, so we have this little cutaway. Do you like this little cutaway? One of my students did that. Yep, cut it out, took it out of the bandsaw, took the head off, took the bandsaw over there and painted it up for me. And he did a hell of a job. I mean, wow. Yeah. So this piece right here is what we call a connector tube. It's a high pressure tube. It's a quill tube, depending upon your manufacturer. That gets a few from here into the injector. That piece is another $400. So to replace the injector and quill tube on this one hole, we're looking at $2,500 per hole. And I got six of them suckers. Okay. So this is where your customer or your, your, your uh, producer probably really doesn't want to screw around with this fuel system in all honesty. They really don't. They can screw things up so bad. Okay. If you look at that, what's wrong with the top of that injector? Yeah, I'm missing a terminal, right? Okay. That we, we contacted Cummins. And again, it's a student engine and they get to over torque and things, they get a little haphazard, you know, that, that happens. Uh, Cummins would not sell us the new solenoid. Okay, fine. So we can send this in and get a new one. It says, no, don't worry about sending it in because if the terminal is broken, there's no core value either. 
Like, holy crap. So we've found an aftermarket, which in the real world I would not use, but for our engines is going to be just fine. We found one for, I think, about $200. Still a lot of money for a little injector. But yeah, this one here is two grand. So if okay. they suspect one of them's not working properly, they need to call the dealer? Yes, <clears throat> yes they do. The nice thing about electronics is the dealer will come out and they'll plug in with a laptop or a PC and they can diagnose right through the, their laptop. Of what, With a couple of clicks of a mouse, they can actually, when we use a, the, the three quarter inch wrench over there, short out an injector, no, no wrenches, we use a mouse now. That's pretty cool. All right, so they can cut out individual injectors. They can do an automatic where the computer actually ramps up the RPM, cuts out the injector. You just kind of sit back and watch the screen. Oh, this is pretty cool. All right, and it is really cool. That's the nice thing about electronics. We, it's taken the diagnostic path for your technicians um, to a whole new level, a whole new level. And some of your older technicians do not want to deal with that. They want absolutely nothing to do with it. And same with your producers, some of your, your older ones. Actually, some of your younger producers want nothing to do with electronics either. It, there's a fear factor involved there. I've got some older customers, if you <coughs> give them a laptop, they're gonna walk away. Other older customers, they wanna know all there is to know about that laptop. So, you know, it doesn't, age is irrelevant, really. It's just kind of the, the mentality of the fear factor, but there's really nothing to be afraid of, okay? This is also um, 115 volts pushing 20 amps, all right? Now, this one also does what's called multiple pulse. That engine there, when I put the fuel in, I had one shot of fuel per injection cycle. This one, I can have up to seven in one injection cycle. So if I was to extrapolate the math, I'm putting in a small shot of fuel every 0 0.1, no, 0 0.01 milliseconds. You know, that's like really, really tiny seconds. <laughs> All right, really, really small. So things are happening extremely fast. In order for that to happen, we need to go back to basics, like your producers need to go back to their basics. In order for that to happen, we need to have zero water in that fuel. We need to have some very, very good uh, fuel filters. We need to have zero debris in that fuel. All right, we have to have the fuel at the correct temperature. All right, can't be too hot, can't be too cold, and the list goes on. So it's all back to the basics to get the efficiency or the energy efficiency and the less emissions, you know, blah, 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 out of this type of an engine, all right? The, the new engine or the new Bosch fuel system, which is in the, the Jags and the Mercedes-Benz and uh, BMWs in Europe is actually giving eight shots of fuel per injection cycle. I mean, that, that's just a, a, a ungodly amounts of speed. It's incredibly fast. The ECM does it all. We do nothing. We just kind of steer in the right direction is all we have to do, all right? None of those vehicles are expensive or anything. So no, no, sure no. The parts for those are just... Just dirt really, cheap. Really yeah. cheap. Really cheap. Really, yeah. told you we don't make anything. I've been driving this Jaguar for some reason. Could you still troubleshoot that on the exhaust manifold with your... Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good good question. So this is our uh, intake manifold over here. Exhaust manifold is missing, but it's bolted on here. Yeah. You get that little non-contact temperature gun? Absolutely you could. Yeah. If, that, if this is not firing correctly, then that temperature will show up. Yeah, you've got a discrepancy in there, so now we start diagnosing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one other thing about safety. If your consumer... So... These are built to withstand lots and lots of pressure, but occasionally because of manufacturing defects, they do split. Typically, they split lengthways, and you're going to have, obviously, fuel coming out. Well, it, you know, it, if I look at that, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to change this out. Change this out, you need a little more, more technical aptitude. But to change that, there's just a few lines and a couple of sensors, unplug them, bolt them on, and away we go. If they <coughs> do have that issue and they elect to change their own, they need to make sure that the fuel system pressure has drained down to a safe working level. If I have been working this engine hard and my ECM decided that I need 40,000 PSI fuel pressure, when I shut that engine off, I've probably still got 40,000 PSI fuel pressure right here. Now I know this one for a fact. To drain the fuel pressure off this engine, I have to wait 30 seconds with the key off. It's self-draining. 
a Cummins ISB and a Cummins ISL. Cummins ISB, you wait 30 seconds. A Cummins ISL, you wait 30 min uh, three minutes. Other engines, I have absolutely no idea. And I wouldn't even guess. I'd call the manufacturer, I'd call the dealer, I'd get into the service manual, whatever I had to do. I would not touch that fuel system until I know that pressure was drained. The only reason I know those three for sure is because I, you know, we have those engines in class, so I've seen the manual like you know, a million times. All right. Other engines, <laughs> I have no idea, and I wouldn't even guess. And that's one thing you need to make very sure, clear to your ag producers, don't screw with this system if you don't know what you're doing. Number one, we've got some very expensive components, but that's irrelevant. You've got some very serious safety concerns here as well. All right. Now, they need to respect it. You know, tell them not to be afraid of it. But they need to respect it, respect that, that fuel pressure especially. Okay. Questions? Producers do decide to take the injector out. Number one, they cannot get the injector out without, actually I'll take that back. You theoretically cannot get the injector out of here without removing this because you see this is recessed in here. There is, a, there is an ex-technician who used to work for a company over in <laughs> South Dakota. He did manage to get that in one of these injectors out of a Case IH engine. Without removing that. Yes. Ruined the injector, ruined the cruelty, ruined the head, lost the job, didn't follow directions, so he, I mean, he cost himself the job. It was a stupid thing to do. If, you know, I, I you know, I'm not real big, obviously, but I can pull these, pop these injectors out with my hands. So if you can't get it out with your hand, well, let's get a little puller. Well, shit, if a little puller doesn't work, well, hell, we got a bigger puller in the tool room. Well, maybe we shouldn't have done that either. <laughs> okay? So this has to come out. Now, when this comes out, there is no O-rings. There is no threads. The only thing that's sealing this to this, there's a, well, you can see it right here. This hole, there's a recess. It's a machine fit. All right? The only thing that's sealing 50,000 psi of fuel pressure right at this point is the torque of that nut and that bolt right there. That's all that's holding that in there. So it's absolutely critical. That's why I'd really, I'd really, I guess, impress upon you to tell your producers not to screw with this fuel system. Just too much at stake, all right? You know, safety and with the, just with the pure damn cost of these parts as well. Back in the day when we replaced these injectors, you, you absolutely had to replace that cross tube. All right, we just, you, just, you couldn't get it without it. Nowadays, they want you to, because this is a lot of money, they just want you to inspect the tip of it. It looks good, and we're going to reuse it, okay? which is, makes a whole lot more, more sense to me. Okay. I mean, this it doesn't work. work as a torque wrench. <laughs> this is what all my producers use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just put a bar on the end. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> what is this line? It rounds the no -bat. That's right. That's my fuel return line. Okay, so the way this actually operates, um, I have fuel coming in here, and the bottom of this nozzle, there's a small needle held closed by a spring. The spring pressure is only about 5,000 psi. Well, if I have 40,000 psi in here, it's not going to hold a, you know, a spring, right? So what happens is a portion of that fuel goes on the top. So I now have the fuel pressure and the spring pressure holding the needle closed. Mr. and Mrs. ECM decides it needs to dump some fuel and energizes a solenoid that pulls up a valve, a little poppet, so this fuel on the top goes out. Now the fuel goes, travels down the side, overcome the spring, we inject some fuel. So the fuel that comes out of here comes out this return. Okay, and then it just goes back to the fuel tank. There's only one returnless diesel engine that I know of, and that's actually the 7.3 power stroke. <laughs> Do you have a return kit on yours? Let me do something, something you want to think about. And the fuel on those heads, actually dead heads, does not go back to the tank. So there is a, um, a you can buy an aftermarket, it's called a fuel return kit for a 7.3. You actually, there's a plug in the end of the head, you pop it out, you put a restrictor in, you sneak some lines back to your fuel tank. Because the issue that um, a lot of Hueys have is that you, you run a little bit of power if you got hot weather, because you know you got really hot fuel in there. If you start dumping hot fuel into your um, injectors, into your, your cylinders, then you're losing efficiency. You're losing power. So it might be something you might want to think about. It's the 6 that. That's, 
I think that one does have the return on it. I know the 7.3s, none of the 7.3s did. The 6.0, I believe, does. Do you might want to check on that. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it does. Yeah, yeah. It's probably just right in the back of the head. And, I mean, they're a tough engine to see anything on, but whenever you feel around there, you should feel lines coming out the back of the head. That yeah. would be why I haven't seen that. <laughs> probably. <laughs> you can't see I squat on that damn thing. I feel around so. back there so if something breaks or something. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. They didn't put. That's not built to work on. Unless you pull the cab off. Well, yeah. there, no, seriously, you do. You have to pull the cab off to work on those engines. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm sending us down a rabbit trail, but how does the fuel get in that? If this is just a bolt, I don't see anywhere along here it, where... Um, actually, I lied to you, that one. Uh, no, it actually, it feeds back through here. Is where it, is this is actually sitting down and right into there. So it actually feeds back through the top. You can see that little crevice right down there? Yeah. Okay, so it actually feeds back all the way through there. That's, and then goes yeah. where, though? It goes back to the tank. Back to the fuel tank. So we don't have all the lines on this engine. Oh, right. Yeah, so we're missing some stuff on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Most of your, um, pretty much 99% of your fuel of the return it automatically just goes back to the tank. Some return it back to the fuel pump, but most of it's gone back to the tank. You have to get recycled. I guess, Steve, my question is looking at fuel efficient for this type of engine. Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't it be instead of just start, you know, taking torque wrenches to it and everything, wouldn't it be more kind of a smarter idea to use the computer um, to detect evaluations that way and then to see potential energy savings that way? Or is that not an option? Just just let it be. Uh, okay. I'm not following your question. What, what computer? Well, the scanner that you can hook it up to. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now, well, let's talk about that. Now we run into a possible price issue because a lot of your, you can have your generic scan tools, um, right. your Mac Mentors, your OTC Genesis, you know, blah, 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 that will, they'll let you kind of look at fault codes. I'll let you maybe look at some um, injector pressures. They really don't do a whole lot, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. If you want to spend several thousand dollars on a laptop and the appropriate software, if you can get the appropriate software, then that would be one way to do that for efficiency, yeah. But, you know, we just invested uh, money in a laptop with uh, Case IH software, the EST program, Electronic Service Technician, as three and a half thousand dollars. You know, so this stuff is expensive. Um, that just does the Case IH. So now if I want to use the same laptop and work on this and work on that Huey and work on that Caterpillar and these other Cummins, I've got to buy all those softwares as well. So you're looking at 20 grand, you know. But, it, I mean, how do I say this? If a producer has a friend that works in a dealership, yeah, happens yeah. to take it in and ask for him to look at um, fuel efficiency out of it just out of curiosity, yep. Yep. He could hook it up to his scanner, put it through the mm -hmm. software, making sure everything's running right. Yeah, they could do um, power balance testing. They can do yeah. injector cutout testing. So like an injector cutout, the, um, you just click, you select what you want, you click go, and the ECM does it all. So the ECM will cut out this injector. Okay. And every other injector keeps on a pumping and doing what it needs to do. Does that for, I think, about uh, uh, one minute energizes that one, lets everything settle for about another three minutes, and it cuts out this injector, okay, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the fuel usage and the power output uh, should be the same every time it cuts out one injector, right? If it's not, then we've got some efficiency issues, but got maybe some mechanical issues, you know, whatever it might be. <laughs> so that's used for both diagnostics, but I see where you're going. Yeah. Uh, if the fuel, you could check fuel usage on that, absolutely. Um, that you had a producer that was really yeah. questioning it. Well, and what you could also do is a better way to do it was have the technician come out to the producer's farm with his laptop, her, her laptop, sit in the buddy seat, we hook up the computer, and we put this thing to work. We go and we do a couple of rounds around the field with a plow on the ground, and then it can really see what the fuel usage is. And if you know, we can go, they can go back, and all these engines are dynoed when they're manufactured. So now we have a baseline of what we should be seeing. And if we are way out of whack, well, let's diagnose what the heck's going on here, because apparently we're not being real efficient. All right, so, yeah, I can't see where you're going with that question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, might cost them a couple of bucks to get the technician out there, but the savings just in fuel, if there's an issue, would, would make up that trip for sure at, you know, $4 a gallon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good questions, guys. What else do we have for questions? You all questioned out because you're going to get homework if asked questions? <laughs> <laughs> right, Nicole? I think mine's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and let's meander back to our classroom. We'll take a little coffee break and we'll hit our slides again. Okay. Um, so this is the inside of a mechanical hydraulic injector. A little different configuration, but this is essentially what was in that international, that black engine. All right, so here I have a needle. I have a spring holding it closed. Fuel pressure comes in, pushes against the spring, one shot of fuel. All right, that injection pressure would come from one of these pumps right here. So this is, in fact, this pump here is pretty much exactly the same as what was on that black engine. All right, just got a couple of cutaways. Um, <coughs> this is what we would call a unit injector. So these are actually out of a Cummins engine. So this one here, I have fuel coming in. I have a rocker on top. The fuel goes in. Rocker pushes a plunger. One shot of fuel. All right, so all these mechanicals, we're looking at just one shot of fuel per injection, okay? <coughs> this one here is an interesting little injector. Um, the white colored case four drive tractors, the 2970s, the 4600 series, the older ones, they had a Scania engine. John Deere used this injector. Caterpillar used this injector. It's called a pencil injector. You know, it kind of looks like a number two pencil, right? So this portion here is inside the head, all right? This portion here is outside the head and it's also outside the valve cover. They typically sit at an angle. Um, if you come across one of your <coughs> producers who is going to pull one of these out, and you, you probably know what the mechanical aptitude of most of your producers is, you might want to give them a little bit of word of advice in getting these things out. Trust me, been there, done that, really sucked. If you have to pull these out, do not, they, they, because they're seeing an angle, there's a little sealing washer here that really doesn't seal all that well. So we get a whole bunch of water and debris down here. So I have a metal tube, I have a metal bore, and I'm going to have rust. All right, so they're going to season there. Typically, you should be just to pull them out of there. All right, what you don't want to do damn thing's not coming out. So you know what, if I grab it and I rock it just a little bit, that'll kind of loosen things up. Well, that didn't work. Well, maybe if I rock it a little more, so I rocked it really hard, and I end up with that piece in my hand and this piece stuck in the head. It really, really sucked, okay? Piece of cake to get all of the spring and the valving, all the crap comes out pretty easily. It's this barrel here, so after I think it was three hours and about three different easy outs. I finally got the stupid thing out of there without ruining the head, too. I was pretty nervous about that. So if your uh, producers need to do that, have them grab it and just rock it back and forth real gently because you can still snap them off, but there's less of a chance than doing this thing. So just rock it gently back and forth as you're pulling it out. All right? I learned that one the hard way. That wasn't good. <laughs> okay. Um, we've seen this one, so this is our high pressure common rail injector right here, all right? This one will give up to seven shots of fuel, and that just depends upon the manufacturer, all right, of how many shots of fuel in the fuel system. One thing I should tell you too, if your customers are going to, God, producers are going to replace injectors, there's such a thing as, as, as called a flow code. And basically, when these injectors are manufactured, they're put on a test stand of the factory. And the, basically, the flow through that injector, a specific RPM and fuel flow, is registered, and it belongs to this injector. And if I look on the very top, see that QR code right there? That tells you all you need to know about this injector. And this one actually has one right on the side there. Okay? Now, when your, your producer gets a new injector, it will come with the flow code. 
the only that flow code must be programmed into the ECM. The engine will run without being reprogrammed. May not run as well as what your producer wants it to because we have the incorrect flow code. All right, so if I take this injector out, the, the flow code for this one's in the ECM. I put another injector in, I still have the old flow code which doesn't relate to this injector. The only person who can put in the flow codes is the dealer. All right, so it might mean that we do have to call a dealer or a technician out with the correct software to reprogram that flow code. It's basically for balancing of the fuel delivery under all operating conditions for that particular piece of equipment. It's kind of critical and not many people know about that code. All right, so kind of critical, yeah, if, you're, if your producers do decide to change injectors, they probably want to do that, okay? All right. Um, this one here you're probably never ever going to see. That is $27,000 sitting right there. That is out of an 80,000 horsepower ship engine. Well, it depends on how many cylinders. Anywhere from 50, actually up to 90,000. Okay. That's out of a Wartzilla. I got several of my graduates are working for Wartzilla. Wartzilla is a, they're based in Finland. Uh, that's where their corporate office is. Their head office in the U.S. is Houston, Texas, and I got quite a few students working in Seattle and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Wallam's actually, he donated three of those to us. Um, they're, they're no good. I mean, they have scrap value, but that's about all they have. It's their, their failed injectors. So they, they're actually running a high-pressure common rail fuel system. They are actually one of the cleanest engines you'll ever come across. And they're in ships. So they actually, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dig out the PowerPoint. I'll show it to you tomorrow morning just for a little information. But they make the largest diesel engine in the world. It's 108,000 horsepower, 50 foot tall. That one is 16, yeah, and crankshaft's 300 tons. You know, we're talking. Oh yeah, we're talking some pretty big iron here. Yeah, it is freaking amazing, absolutely amazing. That engine's actually running a high-pressure common rail fuel system. All right. Now, if I look at this right here, and if I look at this right here, you know what? They're pretty much exactly the same. Okay, and that was one of their biggest issues because they're using a heavy, what they call a heavy fuel. Yeah, so we talked about number one and number two diesel fuel, right? They're using number six. So when they put it on the ship, it's just like pouring really, really cold molasses. They actually, it just comes in a big old brick tank and they put it in the ship and then they actually have to preheat the fuel in order to get it through the injector. I believe they preheat it to about 130, 145 um, degrees. Okay, you get it nice and toasty warm so it'll flow. But it's still pretty heavy and that caused a lot of issues with this little control right here. So they've actually gone to a different controller. They don't use this injector anymore. And the new engine, that's why we got three of them. Okay. One of them is actually up, we'll look at it farm mechanics tomorrow. The torque between this one and this one, these two pieces here, is 1,700 foot-pounds. We didn't have any, anything anywhere close to that. So they actually took one of those apart for us in Fort Lauderdale, and um, one of, he, he actually brought it up with him in a suitcase. <laughs> so, and if you want a good workout, go ahead and lift that up. <laughs> go ahead. I'll get JP to hold the wrench and take it apart. <laughs> Just see how heavy that thing is. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that to the gym. And that's all exactly. Right. <laughs> so you just do you put that in his suitcase? Or? <laughs> Yeah, no, not this one, no, but the one in pieces he did, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was a strong suitcase. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, I'll, I'll show you a picture of that engine or, or a little slideshow of that engine tomorrow morning. It, it's very, very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, pretty heavy, yeah. And this actually shows you, if you look at the. Go ahead and lift that up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is kind of shows you, if you look at the tip, you can actually see the RFI actually on this one right here. So that's the RFI, those little holes right oh, around yeah, that tip there. Okay. So compared with, well, compared with this one right here. Yeah. Hey, I can actually see those. Yeah, I can barely see those ones, but yeah, those ones are. They, so they, Wartzilla's in uh, the Disney cruises, the Carnival cruise ships, Alaskan cruise ships. Um, a lot of power generating stations. 
Actually, they are building, uh, who's, who's in Sydney? Anyone from right. Sydney? Wadzilla is putting a power generation station in just northeast of Sydney, I think you told me, within the next two years. So they're going to have four 10-cylinder engines, I think it is. Uh, so it's power gen, so they can start putting oil, uh, the um, electricity up to the Balkan oil field, is what they're doing. So be looking for that. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah, so pretty cool. Pretty cool. I will be over to see that. I'll stop by and see you. I'm going to yeah. go and look at the construction. I want to see those puppies run. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting they picked Sydney. Well, it's close to the Balkan. Because they're also looking at man camps. Uh, anyone from, who's from the Seiko area? Anyone from the Seiko area? Hinsdale? There's supposedly going to be an 8,000 person man camp going up north of Seiko. Yeah. You want to talk about problems? <laughs> I don't want to know that. Yeah, and see, and that's part of why they're putting in that power gen station. So as you're getting man camps up there too, which I don't really care for, but it's not. Uh, I guess it is what it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still close enough though. <laughs> it's plenty close. Yeah. So. Okay. Now we can head back.